Hello, I'm Adam Hardy and I'm going to talk to you about classification of Indian temples. This may seem like a rather dry academic exercise, something you do after the actual creation of the temples, but I would like to show you how typology, that is the recognition of different forms of shrine, is at the very basis of the design and creation of temples both through the var variations and permutations on a given type and through the combination of different types to create new forms. Now the very broadest division, a well-known one in Indian temple architecture, is between the Nagara and the Dravida, not very broadly north and south. The picture is much more complicated than that, as this talk will try to show, but it's worth bearing in mind that broad division to begin with. Ferguson, James Ferguson, the uh, architectural historian in the 19th century, referred to these different kinds of temple as Indo-Aryan and Dravidian. But these uh, racial labels seem rather quaint and strange for us these days, and we normally use the Sanskrit terms Nagara and Dravida. The term Nagara means of the city. The form is associated with northern parts of India, just as Dravida is associated with South India. But neither form is confined to that respective region. We see here already in the 7th century at the early Chalukyan site of Mahakuta, Nagra and Dravida temples built side by side. The idea of the form or the type is the exterior image of the shrine. That is the shrine comprising the Garbhagriha, the inner sanctum and the walls around it, and the superstructure above it. The architecture of monumental brick or stone temples is essentially representational. Its origins are in imagery, in depictions of buildings. The buildings which leave their vestiges in stone and brick temples are wooden ones roofed with thatch. The kind of building we see represented here in relief on the gateways of the great stupa at Sanchi. The reliefs are of about the first century CE. In this typical relief at Sanchi, we see the kind of timber detailing which later becomes abstracted into the monumental languages of masonry temple architecture. Details such as floor joists, railings, posts, overhanging thatched canopies, and various kinds of distinctively shaped roof. Over here on the left, an apsidal, round-ended pavilion. On top of the roof terrace, in the middle here, a wagon or barrel roofed building with horseshoe gables on the ends and on the projecting dormers at the side, and on the right, a kuta or pavilion crowning a turret, in this case with a, a dome-like roof that is octagonal, bind to create further forms. The five prototype shrine forms are known from stone reliefs and architectural fragments from between around the 2nd to 5th centuries. These examples of the kuta-topped variety are from Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. While this kuta-topped shrine form is especially influential in South India, already around the 2nd century in Gandhara in the Kushan period, we find many examples of this kind of form. As in the, the lower left corner, we see this little Buddha shrine uh, with a leafy canopy and a leafy thatched dome. 
In these Gandharan examples, it's not always clear whether the little pavilion on the top is actually another story or whether this is what some people call a dome and cornice shrine with the space running up inside. But when we come to South India, but certainly by the time that uh, Dravida temple architecture is in full flow, as here on the right at Patadakal and Mahabalipuram, there clearly is a second story as we see the floor joist moulding, the prati, which is the floor of the upper pavilion or the kuta. The dome of the kuta is most often square, but it can be circular, as in that Gandharan example on the left, or it can be octagonal. The rectangular equivalent of the kuta is the shala. The shala topped shrine form is also a typical gateway form, as we see from an early date, and it retains its associations with gateways. The Gopura of the 8th century Kailasanatha temple at Kanchipuram is the forebear of the later towering Gopurams of South India. The proto Vallabhi shrine type is also wagon roofed or barrel roofed with a rounded or apsidal back end. We know this form not just from relief carvings from, but from actual full-size stone versions of wooden buildings seen in the early rock-cut Chaitya halls with their horseshoe arch gables at the front. There can be a single roof as in the 2nd century BCE rock-cut cave facade of the Lomas Rishi cave in Bihar or there can be side aisles and a, a central nave and the, as in the typical cross section of a rock cut Chaitya hall of the early centuries CE. A popular shrine form in second century Gandhara is this form of Vallabhi and this is the Gandharan version on the bottom right hand side. The Farmsana shrine form represents a pyramid of thatched eaves. We see them here in a cloister of shrines, miniature shrines running around the beams of Cave 3 Aurangabad. These are crowned unusually by barrel roofs and little domes. It's more usual for the Farmsana to be crowned by an Amlaka. We see it here in this example from a relief at Sarnath. This has also got a Vallabhi shrine form on its front, developed from the idea of the horseshoe arch being the dormer gable coming out of the thatched eave. And this is a typical combination of Farmsana and Vallabhi. And the last of our five prototypical shrine forms is the type topped by an amlaka. These examples are from Mahakuta on the left and from Cave 20 Ajanta on the right. Now let's look at some early examples of how these different varieties of shrine form are brought together and combined. Here at Cave 1 Ajanta, 5th century, we, over the facade of the cave, we see a miniature cloister which brings together shalas and kuta topped shrines. Back up north in Gandhara in the Kushan period, we've already seen how Vallabhi shrines and kuta topped shrines were typical. On the right, we see the domed kuta type combined with a single roofed Vallabhi in a way rather reminiscent of the combination of Farmsana and Vallabhi that we saw in that fragment from Sarnath. 
In the ruined stupa courtyard of the Gandharan monastery of Tahti Bahi, we see an early example of the monumentalization of prototypical timber shrine forms. The originally wooden forms of Vallabhi and domed shrine types are made out of stone and arranged in an alternating pattern around the courtyard as a kind of cloister. The diagram shows all the main temple forms that I'm going to talk about in the rest of this lecture. Down the side we have the centuries, along the bottom geographically going south to north, and along the top those five early wooden shrine forms which are the seeds of all later temple architecture. In the early centuries of the Nagara tradition, the most important form of shrine was the one known as Latina. This is the one with the curved shikara, with the central lata, the bhumis mounting up, and the crowning gooseberry-like ribbed amlaka. Its roots are in the Vallabhi shrine form, the Amlaka topped simple shrine, and to some extent the Famsana. Its origins are here in the heartlands of the Gupta dynasty, and soon it spreads north, south, east and west. The Gupta period Vishnu temple at Deogar gives us important clues about the early origins of Nagara and more specifically Latina temple architecture. The tower of this temple has only a few um, original fragments surviving what you see here in the tower is mostly rebuilt by the archaeological survey. But if we look at the doorway, we really can understand the principles uh, by which the original superstructure would have been designed. This doorway has an entablature with Vallabhi shrines depicted, both the nave and aisles sort and the single sort. And at the sides, at the base of the pilasters, we have really interesting miniature depictions of proto-Nagara shrine forms. There are two perennial ways of creating new temple forms out of existing ones. One is to put the existing form at the top of a more complicated one, which, as it were, unfolds downwards. And another is for one shrine form to project from the center of another. And both these devices are used in these miniature proto-Nagara shrine forms at Devgar, um, combining the Amlaka type of shrine with the Vallabhi type. The Amlaka shrine form becomes the top of the new form. In fact, it's already a two-story form in the upper tier. It's a fat version of that early wooden shrine form. Below this we have another story with little Amlaka edicules on the corners. You can imagine four corners, we can see the front. And then at the centre there is projected a Vallabhi form. So this is how the Latina form seems to have come about through the combination of earlier forms. A single Amlaka shrine becomes the top of a two-story version. This becomes the top of a three-story version adding one story below with little kutas Amlaka shrines at the corners and a Vallabhi element projecting at the centre. The established form again becomes the top of a new one, 
again with Amlaka shrines on the corners and a Vallabhi in the middle. All we have to do now is to give it a curvature to combine the separate Vallabhi edicules at the centre into a single continuous spine or lata and we have a Latina Shikara. Different specific types of Latina Prasada can now be classified according to the number of projections or ratas and the, and the number of stories or levels or bhumis. So this one has, without projections, three ratas and it has three bhumis. It's three rata, three bhumi. This one has one, two, three, four, five ratas and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bhumis. So it is pancharata and nava bhumi. And this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ratas. It's saptarata and it's got one, two, three, four, it's actually got 16 bhumis. We've seen how the proto Vallabhi form is one of the main ingredients of the Latina temple form. Well, the Vallabhi or the proto Vallabhi itself gets monumentalized and becomes the form that we know as the Vallabhi temple. This shows perhaps the most famous Vallabhi temple, the Telika Mandir at Gwalia of about 750. You can see that it has bhumis like a, a bit like a Latina temple. It has small uh, vestigial Amlaka shrines on the corners, giving it two bhumis before you get to the crowning Vallabhi uh, rectangular element. Vallabhi temples can be single roofed. They can have a nave and aisle like a Chaicha hall. And they can be raised up on stories or bhumis. Of course, the aisles that you would find in a Chaitya hall uh, are merely external forms. There's nothing like an aisle inside. There are no pillars. There's a, a rectangular sanctum because it's the image, the exterior form of the representation of a building, which is the essence of the type. In Orissa or Odisha, what we might call mainstream Nagara architecture arrives by the 7th century, including a version of the Vallabhi mode. The Parasurameshwara temple in Bhubaneswar, the mid, mid, probably mid 7th century, is a Latina temple which has a perennial idea of putting a large Vallabhi shrine image at the centre. In fact, this has three Vallabhi shrine images in a row on each face. Odisha has its own regional terms for Latina, which is usually called Reka Deul, and for Vallabhi, which is often called Kakara in Odisha. As things, as time passes, um, they continue to build Vallabhi or Kakara temples, but the details, the vocabulary changes because of different influences that come into Odisha from outside. The combination of Latina and Vallabhi forms is even more widespread. Most Latina temples have a Sukhanasa 
or projection coming out of the shikara with the, the antarala, the antechamber below it. And together, this projecting part is in the form of a Vallabhi temple. You might not have realized, but that one actually has four Sukhanasas, four Vallabhis emerging from the Latina. This is the 9th century temple at Bajaura in Himachal Pradesh. Actually, when we look in the walls of Nagara temples, that is Latina and later Nagara forms, the niches of the tip in their typical form, which you'll probably recognize as looking like this, are in fact Vallabhi forms which have been developed and proliferated. So even when the Vallabhi mode becomes less popular across northern India, it still exists as a, a type set within other types. Just as the Vallabhi mode is a monumentalization in brick or stone of an early wooden thatched shrine form, so the same thing happens with the proto farmsana, that wooden, tiered roofed, thatched shrine form gets monumentalized and becomes the farmsana mode. In this example from Saurashtra, the roof has a slight curvature. The horseshoe arches or gavakshas protruding from the molded layers represent the dormer windows projecting out of thatched eaves. This similar one is also in Saurashtra. In the same region, there's an alternative farmsana type with this wedge-shaped pyramidal roof, usually crowned not by an amalaka but by a ghanta or bell. This is the old temple at Gop of about 600 CE, which was originally surrounded by an ambulatory. And here is a later development of the same roof form. Farmsana temples are also found in Karnataka during the early Chalukya period in the 7th and 8th centuries. This one's at Aiholi and you can see much more explicitly that it is conceived as a multi-storied building with blind colonnades between the overhanging roofs. In, in Odisha, they have their own form of farmsana, which is known there as the Pidha Deul. It's usually uh, found as the Mandapa or Jagmohan in Arisan terminology, uh, but here it is seen as the shrine itself. In fact, throughout northern India, the farmsana form is probably most familiar as the form of the mandapa or hall, as we see here at Kajarao. Here at Naresar in Madhya Pradesh, we see Latina and Vallabhi temples built side by side. The shapes of the temples, the way the parts are put together, are different. But the architectural vocabulary, the kit of parts, is the same. It's useful to think of this vocabulary or kit of parts as a language, as the Nagara language, which is used to form different shapes of temple, or different ways of putting parts together, which we can call different modes. So these temples are using the Nagara language. They are of different modes, Latina and Vallabhi. They also, within those modes, have particular compositions. For example, the Latina one on the right is Trirata Tribumi. That is its specific type. And then there's the way of making the, the mouldings and the details, the handwriting of the craftsman, of the, of the, the workshop or the regional school, uh, that marks these off as being 
from a particular time or place. They happen to be of that part of central India, late 7th century, and that gives them their style. Language, mode, type, style. It doesn't really matter what words you use as long as you can see the forms and you know what kind of classification you're talking about. But using those terms, uh, this 10th century Pala period, Torana from Eastern India, arranges together Latina, Vallabhi and Farmsana forms. They're all using the same language. They're of those three different modes. Each example is of a particular type. And because they were presumably all made by one person who belonged to a particular group, they definitely all have the same style. Returning to these examples from Odisha, the modes that we see here are Latina and Vallabi, or Reka Deul and Kakara. They're all of particular types, but the language is not the same throughout. On the left, we've got Nagara, but the other ones on the right are different. For example, the one in the bottom right is actually using a version of the Dravida language in its components, its kit of parts. Nevertheless, the style, the feeling, the character in the way they make the mouldings and do the carvings is palpably Odishan. Though they're at different times and it develops and changes, they all belong to the same style. Up to the 8th century, the Vallabhi, the Latina and the Famsana were the main temple forms across northern India. During the 9th and 10th centuries, something began to happen to transform the main Nagara form, the Latina. We saw earlier how that Latina itself, unitary, like a, a single form, nevertheless contains the vestiges of an earlier multiplicity. Vallabhi um, and uh, Amlaka shrines combined and fused into that single unit. Well, a new cycle begins and the temple architect architects begin to create new composite forms, forms that are known as anik andaka, not single egged, the egg being the Amlaka, the globe-like form that crowns the temple. So once again the temple has become composite. It's become a multiplicity of images of temple forms, of edicules, composed together to make up the whole. When a temple has miniature Latina shikaras emerging from the chest of the central shekara, we can call this the shekhari mode. In its simplest form, we have one Latina shekara from which emerge, conceptually, four shekaras. You can call them half shekaras, but Conceptually, they're three-dimensionally conceived, embedded within the body of the temple and emerging out. At the corners, we have little shikaras standing on pillars, which create kuta stambhas. A kuta, a shikara, on a stambha, a pillar. The Shekhari mode was fully formed by the 10th century and within the Nagara tradition it's been the principal temple form ever since. It develops simultaneously in central and western India and in its early centuries its core area is something like this. 
with notable far-flung influences. If shikari means having miniature Latina shikaras emerging at the centre, there are other Anikandaka Nagara forms which don't have that and which we might call proto shakeri One of these has the usual Latina shikara at the centre, kuta stambhas on the corners, and at the centre what is effectively a valabhi element, the proliferation of that form. In typical fashion, this becomes the top of a more complicated form where we have this and then one more valabhi at the centre and four more kuta stambhas at the corners. The game of combining existing types in new ones creates wonderful compositions. This becomes the centre of this. It emerges out from the body of the temple. This one becomes the centre of this and becomes the top of this. This becomes the centre of this and this becomes the top of this. So this last one combines those other three temple types within its fertile matrix and that is exactly what we see at the Lakshmana temple at Kajarao on the right. In the 11th and 12th centuries we begin to get new levels of complexity with not only half shikaras, half embedded shikaras, but also pratyangas or quarter shikaras, three quarters embedded, one quarter emerged, so that you get upon the chest of the main shikara the image of one of those simplest four emerging from one type of shikari temples. And there it is, that very type. A, a typical way in which shakeri temples are classified in the texts is in terms of the number of andakas, the num that is the number of amalakas on top of the various shikaras. The, the prasada is conceived as four-sided, a, a perfect symmetrical form, regardless of any porch or mandapa that there might be in front. So this type is Navandaka. It has nine andakas. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Going back to this one, the one on the right has 37 andakas, if I've counted it right. But in my drawing, to the left of that, uh, we've got actually 45 andakas. And that's because I've drawn it with entirely mini Latina shikaras, rather than farmsana and other kinds of forms. Because the farmsana ones don't count, the andakas are only the ones with amlakas on top. So these, in the actual example at Astoda, these ones don't count as andakas. You can see it's quite a crude way of classifying because it doesn't really tell us the three-dimensional relationships between the parts. Look over on the far right at the mandapa of that temple, and that's what's coming up next, the Samvarana form. If the shakari is a proliferation, a blossoming out of the Latina form, a similar kind of thing happens with the Vamsana, which 
proliferate, becomes composite, and we get a new form known in Western India as Samvarana. Like the Farmsana, it's most familiar not as the shrine itself, but as the form of the Mandapa. So there we have the whole panoply of forms that use the Nagara language, all rooted in those three early shrine forms. But what about the other two early forms, the Kuta Topt and the Shala Topt shrines? Well, at the same time as the Nagara language was forming in the north, in the south, we have the creation of the Dravida. The Dravida emerges out of pan-Indian traditions, and we've already seen hints of it in those shalas and domed kutas at Ajanta. And then the formative beginnings appear across this region. And then it really gets going all across here. The tradition continues through the centuries until today. With its established kit of parts or vocabulary, we can refer to the Dravida language. The Kuta topped timber prototype becomes the basis of the simplest Dravida Vimana or shrine, the Alpa Vimana, Minor Vimana, a fat version of the same made of stone or brick. The earliest surviving example is probably this one here outside the Ravana Padi cave at Aihole, early 7th century. But probably even earlier are these temples at Ter in Maharashtra and Chesarala in Andhra Pradesh, often thought of as constructed Chaitya halls, they're actually proto or early Dravida Alpa Vimanas, but not crowned by Kutas, instead by apsidal Shalas. They have all the range of Dravida mouldings, the Kaputa or thatched eave, the Prati or floor with its joists, the Vedi or railing, the Griva or neck, and the Shikara or thatched roof. An Alpa Vimana can be crowned by a Kuta or a Shala. The Kuta or the entire shrine can be square or circular or octagonal, and the Shala or the entire shrine, can be rectangular or apsidal. The kuta topped form is the most usual, especially square. The alpa vimana becomes the top of more complex forms, which have extra stories or talas, two, three, four, and so on. Each Tier or Tala is articulated as a cloister of interlinked shrines, usually with Kuta edicules on the corners and Shalas in the centre, like gateways to the heavenly palace of the god. So many temple images make up the whole temple, just as many deities are manifested or maybe subordinate to the single god at the centre. The temple images that make up the whole temple are conceived three-dimensionally as if embedded within the body of the whole. The basic types, the basic units of composition, are the one crowned by the kuta, the one with the shala, and a third type 
which has a pavilion with a horseshoe arch gabled form called a panjara. And this is essentially a shala seen from its end. A kuta, shala or panjara can be given an extra story. A great temple such as the Virupaksha at Patadakal is composed of a whole variety of temple images of different shapes and at different scales. Here at the Kailasanatha temple at Kanchipuram, the celestial courtyards of interlinked god residences extend out beyond the towering Vimana itself. The Dravida language that has been created allows a whole range of particular compositions or types which de are defined by the number of talas or tiers and the number and types of shrine image within each tala. Our diagram now shows the great traditions of northern and southern India, the Nagra and the Dravida, along with the early shrine forms which are at their root. I'd now like to talk about three forms of temple that in quite different ways fall between those two traditions, beginning with one that I believe we can call Varata. And if you look at its ingredients, it actually contains all the early shrine forms as its components. The first of these is a form that is what I think certain texts are talking about when they refer to the Varata. This Varata form emerged from the Pan-Indian matrix before Nagara and Dravid had become differentiated, and this is why it shares characteristics with both. The term Varata re relates to the region of Vidarbha or Berar, and certainly there are clues to the later form at the ancient Vakataka capital of Mansar, and indeed at the western Vakataka centre of Ajanta. I, th I think there must have been temples throughout this region which are now lost, probably made of brick. We actually know the form, if you correlate the text and what you can see, from ancient Dakshina Kusala, modern Chhattisgarh state. A prime example is the 7th century brick Lakshmana temple at Sirpur in Chhattisgarh. The tall central element is Vallabhi like with its nave and aisles whole and two half Gavakshas crowning it. But the mouldings and details are very Dravida in feeling. The intermediate projection, not quite as high, is crowned by an octagonal domed kuta, a composite one, but with an amlaka on top of it. And two valabhis, single valabhis, or should we call them panjaras in the Dravida terminology, emerge from it. The corner element is an Amlaka shrine, but with more Dravida-like mouldings again. Later temples in the same tradition explore a variety of star-shaped plans. In the far south of India, people have been building Dravida temples through the centuries up to today. In Karnataka, we begin to see a different way of developing within the Dravida tradition from around the 8th century. And certainly by the 10th, temple forms have developed in such a way that they look very different from, from Tamil Dravida temples. 
to such an extent that some people see them as a different form, a different mode. This tradition can be called the Karnata Dravida, and there's good evidence, at least from inscriptions, if not from texts, for calling this type of temple Vesara. The term Vesara implies a mule or a hybrid, a cross between two different things. But as I say, the architectural language of the so-called Vesara or Karnata Dravida is entirely, entirely Dravida, but the way of developing is such that it acquires characteristics which are reminiscent of the Nagara. It all evolves here and spreads here and here. This is a typical mature type of Vesara Vimana with five ratas and four talas. The wall has stepped forward, bulging out. The edicular components now run all the way up to the top tala, right up to the dome. And the mouldings have got very abstracted away from their timber origins. The earlier Dravida range of temple images has been extended to create a wider choice of new edicule types, most crucially this interpenetrating constellation of shalas. From around the end of the 11th century, the Karnata Dravida or Vesara tradition begins to develop star-shaped or stellate vimana forms. Architects of this tradition were proud of their knowledge of different regional temple forms. While Vesara temples derive essentially from the Dravida language, they often have Nagara elements and their walls can display a rich variety of temple designs in miniature, including regional ideas about the Nagara. And the craftsmen often make exciting experiments in hybridity. So the Varata and the Vesara are in very different ways between Nagara and Dravida. The, the Vesara or Karnata Dravida nevertheless squarely within the, the Dravida language. The third in-between form that I'd like to talk about is the Bhumija, which has its origins squarely within the Nagara. One could say that it grows out of the Latina because the central lata or spine is retained, but the segments of the Latina become vertical chains of kuta stambas, of little shikaras on pillars. But it's not a gradual process of evolution, as we see with the emergence of the shakari from the Latina, or the emergence of the Vesara from earlier Dravida forms. There does seem to have been a very deliberate and conscious attempt around the end of the 10th, beginning of the 11th century in central India to create a new mode, a new temple form. And they did this by, not out of nothing, not, but taking the Nagara language, and, but infusing it with Dravida forms, of which they were very well aware at that time. The heartland and origin of the Bhumija is here in Malwa and here. But very soon the form spreads to all these areas.
Bhumija temples can be orthogonal or stellate. The precise type depends on the number of projections or ratas and the number of levels or bhumis. The architectural language is mostly Nagara. The style of the details is that of workshops specialising in the Bhumija mode. And there are consciously Dravida elements, most importantly the temple form emerging at the centre, which is their Deccani or Central Indian idea of a Dravida Shala topped Alpavimana scene end on. Those people in Marwa who usually did Bhumija temples like the one on the right occasionally also did Shekari temples like the one on the left. These are temples of different modes, but the same people did them. The feeling is the same. The details are similar. They're of the same style. Though similar in date, around the 12th century, the one on the right now is in Gujarat. It's the same mode, the Shekari, as the one on the left. In fact, it's virtually the same composition, the same specific type. And yet the styles are very different. This one is at Kajaraho. It's earlier than the other two, from around the year 1000. It has an ambulatory around the sanctum, with those porches letting in light, but that doesn't essentially affect the exterior composition, which is basically the same as the others, although you can see it has one fewer Ura Shringa or half Shikara on its chest. So, same mode, same type, but if we look at the details, the styles are really quite different. Some people might call these Parmara style, Chandela style and Sulanki style after the dynasties. Din dynastic labels like these are useful because they're quite familiar, but they've gone out of fashion because we don't always know that it was a dynasty who built a particular temple. And of course, a given dynasty didn't always build things in the same, same style. They employed different groups of masons. So it's more usual in scholarly circles these days to name styles after regions. So these would be called Malwa style, Jejakabukti style, and Maru Gurjara style. Still, we should be cautious because a given region doesn't only contain temples of the same style, and of course, any style changes through time. So, there's just one more temple category that I think we ought to add to our diagram. It's way up north in Kashmir. And we can give it the name Kashmir Famsana. This kind of temple was built mainly in the Vale of Kashmir, but with influences round and about. You can see how the roof form recalls the wedgie roofed type of Famsana found in Western India. The wooden origins are very evident when you look at later pitched roofed temples in various parts of the Himalayas. A four faced symmetrical plan is very common and each face has a pitched roofed porch sheltering a trilobate arch. And the form of that trilobate arch goes way back to Gandharan Vallabhi shrine forms. I believe that there was once an alternative type of uh, Kashmiri temple, which had a pitched roof and was rectangular. And we can call this the Kashmiri Vallabhi. 
If you look at Bajaura in a neighbouring region, we have a Nagara temple of the Latina mode with four Vallabhi temples, Nagara Vallabhi temples projecting from it. Similarly, in the Kashmiri Farmsana mode, in a typical form, you have Kashmiri Farmsana with four Kashmiri Vallabhi temples projecting out of it along the cardinal axes. The Kashmiri Vallabhi mode is seen not only in the porches, but also in niches in the temple walls, as temple images or edicules. There are different types. They can have one or two or three tiers of roof. And sometimes one type projects out of another type. This can also happen in porches. As well as the typical two-tier roof, there's evidence from miniature temples and from texts that there were single tiers of roof and even triple roofs. Looking at these Kashmiri temples, it's clear that their language is neither Nagara nor Dravida, and they aren't something that comes in between. Their components are completely different from either of those. And yet, the way in which different types are put together to create new types follows just the same principles. I'd like to end with a few words about classifications and typologies in the architectural texts, the Vastu Shastras or Shilpa Shastras. Do they discuss types? We've seen how the idea of the type is fundamental to the design of temples. What about the theory that they put forward in the text? Well, not surprisingly, uh, typologies loom very large there. There are elaborate systems of classification in a way that's typical of the Shastric tradition in general, in various branches of knowledge. So do these texts provide us with a ready-made, authentic way to understand temple types, along with correct names for them? We might expect this, especially as from around the 11th century at least, certain, certain texts show an awareness of different regional traditions, rather in the same way that um, those masons in Karnataka around that time showed pride in displaying different forms of temple in miniature in the walls which they carved. Well, it's certainly from such texts that scholarship has brought back to currency terms such as Nagara, Dravida, Vesara, Bhumija, Varata and so on. And I've been using them in this talk in a way that I believe is generally accepted by scholars. But what we can't say is that there is one correct terminology for Indian temples. And the reason for this is because texts from different times and from different places use the same terms in very different ways. We've already seen how in Odisha there's a regional terminology. But it isn't just a, a matter of different words meaning the same thing. You can have the same words meaning very different things. A prime example of this is the way northern and southern texts use those famous terms Nagara, Dravida and Vesara in quite different ways. In northern texts, they generally mean this by Nagara and this for Dravida. And inscriptions certainly imply that this is Vesara. But if we look in South Indian texts, they're generally talking all the time about southern temples, that is Dravida temples in our usual terminology. And what they mean 
is that either the whole plan or just the superstructure of the temple is square or rectangular for the Nagara, is circular or elliptical for the Dravida, and is poly polygonal and usually octagonal for the Vesara. Beyond these modes or broad divisions, texts will invariably give instructions for various specific types, each with its own name. We've seen this type earlier, and here I've drawn it according to the instructions in chapter 56 of the 11th century Samarangana Sutra Dhara. In a typical way, the temple is conceived as four-faced um, symmetrical, and it starts with a square, which is then, in this case, divided into eight parts. You'll see there's an ambulatory in the text, which isn't there in the actual example. This one is called Kesari. We've also seen this one. And in this text, it is called Sarvatu Bhadra. This one has got nine andakas, whereas the Kesari had five. And Chandaka and Navandaka. The grid has been increased to 10 by 10. We mustn't think that all Sarvato Bhadras are this, or that this is the universal Sarvato Bhadra temple. It depends which text and which Sarvato Bhadra we're talking about. This is the one in chapter 56 of the Samarangana Sutra Dhara. Like uh, Kailasa or Meru, it's one of the most popular names for temples. It means good on all sides. The text is just giving us a framework. It demands interpretation and improvisation. The style will emerge from the particular craft habits of the school or the workshop. In other words, of the people who make it. This one, in the same text, is called the Narvatmaka. It starts with a square of 21 parts, or padras, or bhagas. It has a huge ambulatory, such as you've never seen in real life. It gives a different division of parts for the corner, or the karna, divided by 10, gives this composition, and later on it says this is a Sarvato Bhadra, just like the Sarvato Bhadra to the left. And in the Prasada as a whole, there are actually 20 Sarvato Bhadras, as well as on the lowest level in the central projection, what it calls a Vallabhi. I don't think one of those temples was ever built, but if you were to try to build it, it would be a huge challenge, and I'm sure the result would be something wonderful and such as you would never have been able to think of without the stimulation of the text. The Kesari and Sarvato Bhadra are the first of 25 temple types culminating in the Meru. Some of the types we recognise from actual examples and others seem to be more theoretical. Each type gives birth to the next, adding four andakas each time. So we start with the Kesari with five, and we end with the Meru with 101. The text explicitly points out the presence of certain types within others. For example, we see that just here in the middle, there is a Sarvato Bhadra. So the text confirms what I've been trying to show throughout this talk, the importance of the classification of the exterior form of the temple, that is the type, and how temple types are combined to make new types.
we've seen how classification or typology was at the very origin of Indian temple architecture. With its reverence for the imagery of ancient wooden building types, which became the basis for masonry shrine forms. We've also seen how the combination of types created new types. And this process rarely stood still. The typology was a dynamic one. Theoretical texts in their classifications are also not static and fixed, but fluid and developing. These texts evolved in parallel with the temple building traditions. And the way in which they typically present designs is sequential, one type emerging from another. The practice and the theory of temple architecture in India show the same way of thinking, which is creative and dynamic. All in all, it's difficult to understand the classification of temple architecture separately from its evolution. I shall develop this idea in another talk in this series, which is on the evolution of temples. Thank you.